Roger Williams University is hosting a crisis management seminar on May 3rd at their Providence campus. Crises, whether a natural disaster, cyber attack, or financial instability, can have severe repercussions if not handled properly. This is where crisis management plays a pivotal role. Join Roger Williams' MBA students and expert speakers to learn how to prepare for the unexpected. The program is totally free and open to the public. You can register online at rwu.edu slash events slash crisis dash management dash symposium. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Inside Public Health is brought to you by CCA Health Rhode Island. Commonwealth Care Alliance, or CCA, is a multi-state integrated care system influencing innovative models of complex care nationwide. CCA's Uncommon Care model focuses on sustainable and evidence-based health care breakthroughs that improve the health and well-being of people with significant needs and is consistently recognized as one of the best models in the country at identifying and serving traditionally hard-to-reach individuals. CCA is excited to bring Uncommon Care to Rhode Islanders with a range of Medicare Advantage plans. To learn more, visit www.commonwealthcarealliance.org backslash Rhode Island. Thanks again, Bill, for the invitation to participate in this conversation and to join my esteemed colleagues. I'm Carrie bridges Feliz. I'm the Vice President of Community Health and Equity for the Lifespan Health System. Uh, I have been at Lifespan for about eight years and oversee our Community Health Institute. So I'm a, I'm a public health professional and this department that I oversee, the Community Health Institute is focused on um, a lot of public health strategies to improve the health of the populations we serve, both the patients in our system and, and the residents in our service areas. Hey, thanks very much, Corey. Good morning, Bill. Uh, happy to be here as well, especially with this panel on such a great topic, important topic for Rhode Island. I am the general manager of CCA Health Rhode Island. Uh, I've been here for about two years and have been working in the health insurance space in Rhode Island for the last 23 years. Uh, so native of Rhode Islander, this is near and dear to me uh, and something that's really important as we go forward. Thanks so much. And Dr. Nunn. Good morning. My name is Amy Nunn and I'm executive director of the Rhode Island Public Health Institute. Our mission is to reduce health disparities in Rhode Island and beyond. All right. Pretty straightforward. And that, look, that's a topic that We've learned so much about over the last few years. There was it was a kind of a specialization area in terms of public health and the deserts in public health. And the general public started to learn more and more about things like disparities in social determinants of health, housing, food security, brick and mortar facilities, transportation, so on and so forth. So, you know, let, let's begin with Carrie. What what would you say in the now waning, let's hope, days of COVID-19. What are Rhode Island's most pressing gaps when it comes to equity in healthcare and in public health? Yeah. And, you know, honestly, Bill, if you ask different people, you may get different answers to this question, but I'll tell you what's going to inform my answer to your question. We've recently completed a series of community health needs assessments um, where we go out to, again, not just patients in our system, but folks who live in the service area of the lifespan hospitals, which as you know, is really covering the whole state and the region. And we ask, what are your health concerns? You know, what are you concerned about right now? Um, what challenges are you experiencing? How would you like our hospitals to help you address those challenges? And um, it, it that experience, um, the community health needs assessments, the community forums that we've done and the surveys and the interviews with health leaders is really what's informing the answer. So. Um, access to health care is still a challenge. Um, and when I say health, I'm saying health very broadly. Again, I'm a public health person, so I'm, I'm big picture thinking. That includes behavioral health. Um, and I would put an emphasis on access to behavioral health and access to primary care. Um, regardless of insurance status, we still have a lot of folks who struggle to get a primary care provider. And primary care is often the anchor that can help a person then access other health services, specialty services, behavioral health services. They don't have to exist one in the same entity, but, be, but primary care can really help as, a, as an anchor and navigator. And access to primary care is difficult. Access to behavioral health care is, is even more difficult at the same time that we're seeing behavioral health concerns rise. Coming, as you mentioned in your intro, coming out of the pandemic, um, we have there's a greater appreciation for behavioral health, but there's also greater demand for services. We're seeing it across the age spectrum. Um, you know, we see a lot of kids who need behavioral health services and end up 
uh, being effectively, you know, housed in units that are not the appropriate setting of care because they because the appropriate setting of care doesn't exist or is too limited in supply. So, you know, access is still a huge issue. Dr. Nunn, uh, oh, pardon me, please finish. Sorry to, sorry to cut you off there. No, no, no. I'll just, uh, I, I I want Amy and, and um, Corey to weigh in on this, but I'll, I'll say in addition, what we've learned from the, the needs assessments that we recently completed and, and is validated by our ongoing work, screening patients for health-related social needs is, um, you know, there's this term that I, I started using. Um, there's a blanket of distress across the population. People are very concerned about their ability to make ends meet, to take care of themselves and to care for others, whether it be children or aging parents, but that caregiver role, as well as caring for oneself, folks are legitimately concerned. And it's not limited to one city or town or to one cultural background. This is across the board. And, um, you know, the symptoms of this emotional distress, is, you know, things like, you know, are continuing to rise overdose rates. Um, the concerns around um, folks are, are concerned about how to just uh, keep a roof over their heads. I mean, you you spoke previously in your podcast about housing. You had, stuff, you know, Stephanie Pryor and uh, Courtney Nicolato on, uh, you know, the housing challenge is real and it is experienced by people every day. Food continues. We, food is always among the top three needs that we see among patients. During the pandemic, it was number one. In the last year, year and a half, it's faded to number two because it's been eclipsed by housing. Uh, you know, it battles for first or second place all the time. But despite all of the supports that were put in place during the pandemic, and many of those supports are now have wound down or are winding down, uh, folks are in increasingly vulnerable positions in their households and, and just don't know how they're going to make it day yeah. to day. And, and and all of that is intersectionality at its highest peak with health and wellness at the core of that conversation. There's so many different prongs away and and two, I guess, arteries and veins when it comes to the conversation of of public health. Dr. Nunn, you know, in, in in the work that you do on the ground, you know, we've seen an improvement in or at least we learned about what we should do in terms of basic things, you know, washing hands, sanitizer, just behaviors that can mitigate to some extent, whether it's infectious disease or anything else, really. Um, are we on track? And if we're not, how do we get back on track just in terms of the basics? I think the biggest, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of collateral damage um, from the COVID pandemic. One of the biggest things is that we're seeing that people have, um, not been able to follow up with their primary care providers or they've not been able to get slots because in, in pri primary care is increasingly constrained because of the stresses on our health system with the mass exodus of healthcare personnel out of public health and medicine. So that's a big crisis. I think when, when we're thinking about getting back on track, one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we get people to resume preventive health services and to get back into primary care because primary care is really the nexus for where things should start. Um, and so we're working with all of this. We're running a collaborative of safety net clinics from around the city of Providence. Um, there are five or six members of our collaborative as well as the mayor's healthy communities office where we're working collaboratively with all of the safety net clinics to encourage people to get back to primary care and to resume all of their preventive health screening screenings like mammograms, colonoscopies, all the things that happen during the course of routine primary care. People overwhelmingly, um, there's been a huge, I'll just say, there's been a huge decline in uptake of preventive health screenings since COVID and we're trying to get people um, to come back in. So critical. Corey, one thing that CCA Health did, this is just one example, and I think I've mentioned it before here in our recurring series, reimbursement for shoes, you know, motivating people to, and when you think about preventative care, thinking in terms of health and wellness and whether it's diet or exercise, things like that as well. How does, how does CCA Health sort of spur that conversation and, and really that activity is when it comes to preventative care on the personal side, just day to day. Yeah. So it's at the forefront of everything we think about as we go in and, and especially as we think about product and benefits. 
we're probably more non-traditional than a lot of a lot of carriers from that standpoint. We have a, a member voices panel, so comprised of existing members. We do an awful lot of listening, and it's listening on what's going on in the communities, what's going on with our members, and then from there, what are the challenges that we think they're currently facing and or will be facing. And so the the sneakers is a good example. When we think about our older adult population, we're trying to understand that that population for the last three years has really largely been locked up at home. Uh, they've been isolated away from family, friends, and that's also taken a toll ment on their mental health, but also on their physical health. And as you think about just the ability to get up, walk around, go out in the community, a lot of that was taken away. And so when we went into looking at the types of things that you want to offer and make available, they're typically trying to address things that we see going on from a social determinants of health perspective, whether it's food, utilities, um, access to things like telemedicine that can keep people connected to their providers, even if they're socially isolated. Um, those sneakers became an important part for us of making sure that people can afford to get shoes. And it's not just you know running sneakers. We're thinking of someone who's going to be running a 5K. Sometimes it's just comfortable sneakers to get up and walk around the house. And that is just as important as somebody who may be healthier that is running a 5K. Uh, and so just making sure those things happen and how they show up. And that allows us to complement some of the things that someone like a Lifespan or um, Open Door Health is doing with their patients is this allows us to bring extra things to the table that perhaps weren't available before and allows us to have a more holistic look at the at their health. And that, kind of like Carrie said earlier, it's the population health mentality. Everybody's needs are different. Not everybody shows up the same way. To that point, if we could go around the panel here and just name something that is working, something that that is a that's either a program or a concept or a theory that has been implemented and is going well. Because we spend a lot of time in doom and gloom, frankly, and even things that are maybe not doom and gloom, but problematic. What's something that's working? We'll start with Carrie. So I think uh, it is a positive, just as, as Corey left off, you know, there's a greater recognition of the social drivers of health. There's, um, you know, fewer places that you can turn now and people not acknowledge, um, you know, what research has shown for many years, but not acknowledge that, you know, access to food and access to safe and healthy housing and transportation and healthy relationships, you know, that that actually impacts a person's health status and health outcomes. So that's a good thing. And as a result, we're seeing investments in social determinants of health starting to increase. I mean, we've we've had community-based, place-based work funded by the health department for a number of years now through the HESES, but we're seeing slight increases in like housing, um, home stabilization funded through Medicaid. We're seeing um, food pilots. We did one of our own at Lifespan um, last year, providing food directly to patients, medically tailored food and produce to make it easier for them to access healthy foods and prepare healthy meals. Those, those are positives. Um, you know, the work that Amy does at the Public Health Institute is a tremendous example. Yeah. Um, and there's an opportunity. I don't want to say, you know, I know we're focused on positive right now, but the opportunity, Bill, is to really do those programs at scale. Mm, absolutely. And you mentioned the Rhode Island Public Health Institute, Food on the Move, and, and you know, one of the many great programs that you're involved in, Dr. Nunn. But what, what do you see as the bright spot right now if you if you were given the chance to stand on top of the independent man in the state house with a bullhorn? Well, one of the things I'm really excited about is an advocacy campaign that we led last year that was very successful called Nourish Rhode Island. And we advocated and the legislature funded a program that will provide SNAP incentives in retail settings. What is a SNAP incentive? It doubles the value of the dollar when people buy fresh produce. We have had a program for SNAP incentives at the Public Health Institute for almost a decade now, but we worked with the legislature to get funding from the COVID relief dollars that will fund that in grocery stores. So for the first time, people will be able to walk into their neighborhood grocery store and use SNAP incentives. So what does that mean? So pe people who have, who SNAP benefits, or it's often known as an EBT card, um, SNAP is the nation's federal program to address hunger. And they will be able to walk into a grocery store and get a 50 
percent discount when they buy fresh fruits and vegetables. So we think this is really important because in a survey that we did, about 30 percent of people said that they can't afford fruits and vegetables across the city in the city safety net health center. So people are having big problems affording healthy uh, food in the wake of the pandemic and also with what, everything that's going on with inflation. So this big program will be rolled out, we think in the third or fourth quarter of this year, that will make buying fresh produce much cheaper for people who live in poverty in our state. And that's something I'm really proud of. It's also something, it's a program that often enjoys bipartisan support because it's a market-based solution for addressing hunger and healthy eating. Um, and it's a way to make healthy eating more affordable and accessible to the common person in Rhode Island who might struggle to buy fruits and vegetables and eat healthy um, because of um, their socioeconomic status. So mm -hmm. I'm thrilled about that. I think it's a program that has both local and national implications. There's a, there are a lot of eyes on it, and I think it'll really help improve healthy eating for the 144,000 Rhode Islanders who are on SNAP. Corey? Yeah, I think the biggest uh, successes I've seen over the last three years really have been innovation and collaboration. I think we've we've had a great example in a number of fronts of public and private community-based organizations coming together to try to solve challenges that is what it takes, but for whatever reason was not happening in the past. I think the pandemic forced a lot of that forward. You know, I look at some of the work going on, whether, you know, Food on the Move is a great example of a community-based organization doing some great things. I look at Meals on Wheels, um, West Bay Community Action, and some of the other regional community action programs have really done some innovative things within their space. Um, the Ocean State Center for Independent Living continues to be a, a big voice uh, for those living at home. Um, the Village Common of Rhode Island is a one that's come up recently, which is a really innovative program to address social isolation uh, for older adults in their home with retirees from the community that you live in. Um, and Crossroads continues to be a, a leader in a lot of the space, uh, particularly in the housing space as we go forward. So I think there's been a lot of innovation, probably more than we've seen over the last 10 years or so. And, and I expect that that's going to continue to go forward, which is great. I think we have some incredible programs and a foundation for, for success in Rhode Island. You know, one thing Bill, that is, oh, oh, pardon me, please. I was just going to add one more if I could, Bill. Absolutely. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the housing crisis and we haven't heard a lot about solutions, but one of the other things that was funded by the COVID relief dollars in the last legislative session was a $200 million earmark to build affordable housing across the state. And um, it has gotten some media coverage, but maybe not enough. That will probably be enough to build a few hundred units, which would go a long way to addressing some of the housing crisis and the homelessness uh, in particular. Yeah, no question about it. And that's like a, another couple of panels we could do just on that issue alone. Um, Corey, you know, something that is that is at the forefront of your organization's uh, model, if you will, and is really critical to public health as a whole is reaching people who would be defined as hard to reach, hard to reach, hard to reach patients. And, you know, your perspective from the CCA window Talk about the role that insurers and providers can play in that effort and what specifically CCA is doing with its own efforts when it comes to hard to reach patients. So I think insurers play a critical role in this as we as we start to think about public health much differently than what you've seen historically in commercial payers. It really requires us to listen and to understand our our members and connect that back into the rest of the delivery system. And similar to what I the way Carrie described it, when I think of the delivery system, it is your traditional medical, it's your BH, it's also your community partners. In many instances, a core part of what we consider someone's health is actually being delivered through community-based services. And historically, those were thought of completely separately and differently. And so that really requires us, as we think about our model, is really founded on that. 
And so understanding and recognizing that until you address a lot of those community-based challenges and gaps in care that individuals have, it's really hard to focus on some of those other challenges. And so when we start onboarding a member, we're listening. We're, we're probing with questions, but we're more importantly listening to what our members are saying to help us really understand what are those challenges that they have. So about 10% of our population is actually unhoused. That presents one challenge. And so as you think about the traditional member or what we would have considered a traditional member uh, that has a consistent living situation, we have to find new ways to get in front of those individuals to find them, whether it's at a shelter, whether it's out on the in the community, in the streets. Um, that requires us to be in the community. And that is very different, I think, than where insurers were 10, 15 years ago. That's not that's not what a lot of insurers were thinking about. Um, that also requires us to show up with a, a different set of resources. So whether it's a social worker, a community health worker, someone who is able to meet someone on their terms and understand that. And as we are able to build that trust in the community with that individual, from there, then we can start actually addressing some of those challenges. And it could be as simple as, we need to find and leverage resources to get per that person access to a phone. And so once they have access to a phone, we're able to then more consistently get in contact with them, connect them into housing supports and try to pull them back in into other resources that then can start addressing some of their BH or medical needs. That's really, it's a, it sounds simpler than it really is, but our role really is to kind of knit together all of those different parts of the system and that's community-based organizations, medical, BH, and make that work fairly seamlessly on behalf of our members. All right. We've got a couple of minutes left here, and that leads me to one final question, which is when we think of the players, and we use that word and term, I suppose, very loosely because you can incorporate – you go as wide as you know municipalities and you know some random town council when it comes to – public health and policies you know you can make that argument that it's very it's a vast um pool of people but however you would define the players in public health in Rhode Island is there enough collaboration between those organizations between those individuals between those thought leaders and if not what is the biggest element that is lacking and let's uh, let's start with Carrie and work our way around the panel here well i think that there is um a lot of synergy in terms of identify, uh, identification of priorities, right? And you're right, the, the pool of players, the stakeholders are very diverse. Um, unfortunately, we still, so I think where there's synergy is that we recognize, you know, that social drivers of health are important. We recognize that health and well-being are critical to our society, right? We, we share a vision of really having all of our population thrive. You know, that's, I think, where we're, you know, in agreement. Unfortunately, we still operate our systems in such a way that we're oftentimes competing for resources. Um, we have not yet made the shift and inclusive in the we is, you know, state and federal funders because they're oftentimes big drivers of change and policy, but we haven't made the shift yet to really truly be equity based and equity focused. Um, and that I think would help if, it, if we start with the end in mind of what's the unit of change we're trying to have? If we're trying to stabilize a household, what are the policies, programs, supports, investments that will be needed to really help that household stabilize and thrive and the individual members thrive? And it having that, you know, we use the language of like patient-centered and person-centered care and services, but to truly be patient and person-centered requires rethinking how we organize our services, how we package funds. The, the 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 knitting together that Corey mentioned of services also requires knitting together dollars and resources and having an expectation that different disciplines are coming together um, and and agreeing on outcomes and uh, setting milestones along the way. So I think there's tremendously good intent. And I am, um, I love what I do because I in part get to work with amazing, committed, intelligent people who share, you know, some some of the same goals. Um, but as stakeholders, with the support of you know state and federal uh, funders, we do need to come together to really um, kind of order our steps in a sense, and to um, apply a filter that would have us leading with equity and organizing our work around principles of health equity. Thanks, Dr. Nunn. I agree with all of that, and um, 
I one thing I love about working in Rhode Island is that you can meet with anyone um, and everyone takes your meetings. So everyone's just a phone call away, including the governor and most of the legislature and pretty much anyone that you want access to. You can um, get meetings with those folks and they listen. And that's amazing and something not to be taken for granted. I agree with everything that Carrie said. I want to put a finer point on one of those issues. The most important thing we could do for health equity, I believe, right now in 2023, is to improve our Medicaid reimbursement rates. Our reimbursement rates are abysmal compared with our neighbors in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And it makes it very difficult for um, our our health system to take appropriately care for the Medicaid population. And one of the things that often goes unnoticed is our overwhelmingly good rates of health insurance coverage. 96% of Rhode Islanders are covered by health insurance. One problem is though, is that our reimbursement rates are so low that there's a big disincentive for providers and health systems to accept Medicaid patients, and it creates a huge equity problem. Last year, we had improvements in reimbursement rates, but we'd like to see them come up again and, and in terms of thinking about what we could do better in terms of collaboration. I would love to see the legislature take this on. This has to be appropriated every year by the legislature and signed by the governor, and I would love to see those reimbursement rates come up again. We operate Open Door Health, which is a safety net health clinic. We are happy to take Medicaid patients, although I will say that that is um, something that costs a lot um, and eats into our bottom line. A lot of other clinics do not want to see Medicaid patients because of the low reimbursement rates, and that creates an equity problem. So if we could just get our reimbursement rates up to where they're approaching or even, you know, um, approaching those of Massachusetts and Connecticut, that could have a huge impact on health equity across the whole state immediately. Oh, so obvious and critical, right? <laughs> when you really break it down. All right, Corey, your uh, your take on the the collaboration out there? Yeah, I com completely agree with everything that Carrie and Amy have said. I I think when you look at where we are in Rhode Island. Collaboration is happening. It, it's happening more than I've seen it in the past. There, there's some key pieces as we think about that going forward. It's more than just showing up at the table, though, to have a conversation. And, and similar to what Carrie and Amy said, we need to make sure that we're looking at things holistically all the way through, and that includes funding. When you're talking about addressing some of the challenges uh, that we, we had earlier in the podcast and on our conversation, it requires us to interact and connect dots on some of the most complex situations you can come across. You can't underfund uh, the ability to take care of patients that show up with some of those challenges and expect that you're going to be get be able to get equitable care. And, and, and that's an important piece. And I am saying that distinctly, equitable care, everyone should be able to get access to the care that's necessary for them to be able to take care of their health. And that, that's an important piece that I do think when we show up, an important part of my job is making sure that I show up as a partner and I'm listening. I don't know all the answers. I don't, I don't even say that I or start to think that I know all the answers, uh, but I know that we have a lot of smart people in this state in all different parts of the delivery system and getting people together to have those conversations and some of the hard conversations, which include those financial conversations on how do we make sure we structure this so it's developed right from the ground up and it's sustainable as we go forward. We've got a great delivery system and some incredibly smart people in Rhode Island. I think we just need to see the pace of change a little bit quicker. And I, I think, you know, what's what's at risk for us is our patients. And as we think about our ability to change and to to be more innovative quicker, that's what's, what we're really trying to solve for is putting the patient at the, at the base of what, everything we're doing and ensuring that people aren't falling through the cracks, which is what's happening today. Corey McCarty, General Manager at CCA Health Rhode Island, Dr. Amy Nunn, the Executive Director at the Rhode Island Public Health Institute, Carrie bridges Feliz, Vice President of Community Health and Equity at Lifespan. Thank you all so much. What a great panel today. 
Thank you all. Thanks for having us. Thank you. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.